But you know, it's amazing the language we grew up with is so twisted from the truth. You heard this phrase all your life, don't get your hope up. All your life you heard that phrase, well, my brother, don't get your hopes up. Hey, guys, it's better. Don't get your hope up. The Bible's the total opposite. It says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the realization of your hope. Hebrews 6 says that hope is the anchor of your soul that goes through the veil into his presence. So what the Bible teaches is get your hope sky high because everything flows out of hope. And we grew up hearing don't get your hopes up. We heard phrases like what you don't know won't. And the Bible teaches what you don't know is destroyed. You hear how twisted things were growing up? The way that seems right to a man. There's a language on the earth that came through the fall. It's called the wisdom of man. It's the knowledge of the earth. It's not the wisdom of God. Here's another one. What you see is... The Bible says never live by what you see. You don't live by the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen because they're eternal. You live by what the Word of God says. Isn't that cool? You make your bed. You sleep in it. He made a brand new bed. <laughs> I'm not reaping what I've sown. I deserve judgment and I have mercy. I deserve death and I have life. <laughs> Look at what I deserve. Get what he gave. Do you see how twisted things are? Your whole life, you heard that stuff and it becomes our wisdom and it's not the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 says that Christ Jesus has become the wisdom of God for us. So we have to look through Him and live through Him. Amen? Just some good thoughts. Just throwing them out there. I had to laugh when the pastor said he put the M on his hand and he forgot what it was for. <laughs> I just thought that was what a humble guy to tell us that story. I just like that. I'm sitting there laughing. And you know what came to mind? I do this all the time at home. I've got things at home and I still don't know where they are. Because I put them in special places to remember where I put them. <laughs> and then when I need them, I say, where was that special place? And then you ram, who's ever done that? And then you ransack the house and you can't find it because it's in such a special place. I sat there and got silly because I thought, man, we're all in the same boat. We need the mercy of God. Without Jesus, we're in trouble. Because <laughs> I've done that. We've got these keen ideas. And I'm, well, let's put it here. My wife and I in agreement. Let's put it here. And then we're like, where did we put that? Remember, we put that somewhere we would forget. <laughs> we both forget. And I think those things are still lost today. <laughs> just fun. It's just, you can have fun in church. It's hard. Thanks for singing that song that we ended with. I was sitting there with all kinds of, there's so many things we could preach and it would pass, you know. Actually, we could preach a lot of stuff and it would all be good and make sense. And you want to be right when you come somewhere. You want to say what God wants to say to the group that's here. It's not just about preaching. It's about saying what God's saying. And I have a lot of, I, I travel a lot. So I, I meet a lot of people. I see a general mindset, the body of Christ. I see a lot of things. I have a real heart to teach on the truth about healing. The will of God to heal. We'll not do that tonight more clearly. We'll see if we have grace. That, that stuff's in my heart. That's a passion. I, I could do that. But when you sang that song about the image of the Lamb, I had all these thoughts go through my heart and like, Lord, you know, I covered a lot of stuff last night. And I just want to be right. And you started singing that song. And it just was confirmation to me. I was sitting there and then you did sing it just twice or three times. You sang that paragraph about ten times. And I'm like, yes. I was so excited. Because that's what it's all about. That's the reason you're born again. See, ah. Oh. And don't think that I'm not happy about eternal life or everlasting life or my name being in the book of life. But I'm telling you, in this country, we need the whole emphasis of Christianity, praying and prayer to go to heaven someday. And we're really missing the boat back on why we're Christians. We did not pray and prayer to go to heaven someday. We've been made right with God. We're born again. We put off the old. We put on the new. 
We're transformed from within. We've cleaned the inside of the cup so the outside is clean. We take back on the nature and image of God our Father. He said, when you see me, you see him. And he told us to follow him. So when you see us, you ought to see him. Knowledge puffs up, love edifies. If you're not careful, you'll let a lot of things take the place of your relationship with God. Just church attendance is your Christianity. Just, just your Bible reading, your daily devotion can take the place of actually intimacy and knowing God, as strange as that sounds. Because you do it religiously, rhetorically, because it's the Christian thing to do. It's possible in the day we live to have a Christian ringtone, a Christian screensaver, a Christian bumper sticker, a Christian t-shirt, and Christian music playing all day and never make contact with God. And your knowledge can puff you up. Your Bible knowledge. You just study your Bible to be a know-it-all. And then you respond scripturally and get in debates with people and get your heart to be hard as a stone, hard as a stone in your heart. I've met people like that that just wield their Bible knowledge and reveal in that that they have no revelation of Father's heart. And it's a tragedy because it doesn't draw people to Christ. It gives people a very bad impression of what we are. Go to Colossians 3. I'm not mad at anybody. I, my heart, just, oh, I just so want us to see why we're Christians. We're Christians to get restored back to original value. We're Christians to walk in the cool of the day with Papa. We're Christians to be one with Him. Christianity is union with deity. It's oneness with God. It's two becoming one. Where you begin to look through His eyes. Where you begin to see what he sees and live through his heart. He's not holding back anything. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It says if you receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, you'll reign as a king in life. Oh my goodness. We've got to understand what we've done when we've gotten born again. We've turned it into a quick prayer to assure your name in a book and one day you're going to heaven. And we forgot a new creation reality. We forgot that old things pass away and all things, all things, all things become new. Amen? Amen. There's great joy in what I'm saying because anything else is where the burden is, the struggle is, the pressure is. It's good to be free. It's good to be free from yourself and free from one another and in a place to love. See, you don't put expectations on each other. You don't give permission for each other to allow them in your sight to fail you and all that stuff. In other words, what's your name, son? Irene. If I meet Irene and I put expectation on her shoulders, and all of a sudden Irene has to function a certain way for me to be okay, I've just done Irene great injustice. I've just set her up to fail me, for me to be disappointed, and me to fail to see the truth that I'm going to Why? Because I'm depending on her to be something in my life at the cost of everything. All of a sudden she can fail me. All of a sudden she can hurt me. All of a sudden she can break my heart and let me down. Disappoint me. We live that way as Christians and think it's normal. The church is hurt within herself all the time. And I'm saying why? If we're Christians, why if we love? Why if the heart of God is in us? Why if we're the children? of God. The church is hurt within herself all the time. Why? It should be impossible. It should be strange. Because we love one another. Not expect one another. Love one another. Now come and preach the gospel here. You're all right. <laughs> I preach what I live every day of my life. Because 16 years ago, this message I'm preaching to you made me free. It made me what I feel like is probably the most joyous man on the planet. Sometimes it doesn't feel fair to me how I feel. And I travel around and I see that people don't understand. People are bound just in everyday life. Circumstances are determining who they are. What people say or don't say is the ruling factor of their life. But yet they're good people and they do love God. 
but don't understand how to make this, diff this distinguishing <laughs> thing in their life. All of a sudden, what a man says rules them, but what a man doesn't say rules them. And then they need, then they're always at the mercy of men. Then they need somebody to do them right to be right. And you're constantly failed and disappointed and hurt. And your identity's in crisis. And you're always waiting for someone horizontally to do what you need them to do for you to be okay. And we were so okay. Are you following me? See, you don't owe me anything. You don't even have to appreciate me. You never have to thank me. You don't even have to like me. I want you to, but I love you. You don't owe me anything. Love doesn't say, I love you. Do you love me? <laughs> That's what we grew up saying. That's what most relationships consist of, even in the church. What, don't you love me? Don't you love me? What you're saying is, I love you for me. What you're saying is, I'm still alive unto myself. And I need you for my sake. And it's a twist. It's a trap. And it'll leave you hurt. It gives you permission to be offended and failed and disappointed. That one mentality will rob you of his nature. Love never says, I love you. Do you love me? Love only ever says, I love you. That's all it says. It cries from the cross through innocence becoming guilty. I love you. And the gospel just wrecks me. Because it's what I never understood. And I struggled so bad. So angry inside. So empty. So hurt. Trying to be okay and not okay. Because you know, everything just doesn't go your way. People aren't the way you feel you need them to be. <laughs> and until your perspective changes on that, you'll never be okay, because that will never change. I say, if you're touchy, you're going to be touched. <laughs> True? We're Christians to take on the nature and the image of God and manifest who He is to the world. We're Christians for that every time we're in a trial, it's not even about the trial. It's about manifesting Him in the trial. It's about rebuilding. You overcome evil with good. You tone down a harsh word with a kind word. Mercy triumphs over when you don't give men what they deserve in the natural, but you love them, show them mercy, we're afraid psychologically you're enabling that. No, you're convicting their heart with unconditional love, and the goodness of God leads them to repentance. There's certain lines where you understand by the Spirit that it would be enabling. There's certain places to hold people into accountability. And I'll tell you what, when you give a cold cup of water to what seems to be an enemy, there's hot cold seats to come back. Come on, it's scripture. It's Jesus. I taught it last night with Malchus and his ear getting cut off. He's there to kill Jesus in the garden with the clan. And Jesus fixes the guy's ear that his disciple chopped off. So instead of getting his disciples around him to protect him and keep him from these mean and wicked men, he rebukes his disciple for acting like them and then heals the guy that he hurt. And the guy's there to kill him. Are you following this? The guy's there to kill him. Peter cuts off his ear. He rebukes his disciple for acting like them and then heals the guy he hurt. And then they take him and kill him anyway. Why? Because it's love. It's Jesus' way of saying to Malchus, you don't even know who I am and know who you are. But by love, I'm going to show you an ordinary child. And even though you seem like you're in adversity to me, and on the other side, I see a greater value in you. I see a greater destiny in you. I see a greater purpose in you than what you have an understanding of. See, because that kind of love brings the best out of you. 
It digs deeper than what you see. It goes down in to the core of created value and makes it draw on truth. <coughs> Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He didn't say, judge them, Father. They're a bunch of knuckleheads. He said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. God forbid we let man's blindness keep us blind. God forbid we judge books by their cover. You judge with righteous judgment. And you realize you paid the price for the rejection of everyone because everyone's worth it to God. You just don't know it. We prove this kind of stuff all the time in church. I don't know how I'm on all this, but I just feel like this image thing is so important to just say. Can I be honest and just share the extreme belief of my heart? It's the whole reason we're Christians. The whole reason that we gather on a Sunday should be because it's a Sunday and it's our Christian duty or our Christian thing to do or it's just nice to go to church. It's so much more than that. We've turned it into that. Well, it's Sunday. Or we wake up, oh man, it's Sunday. Boy, I wish I could sleep in. I, I did that for a lot of my life. So I know people do that. It's not about that. I'm not saying you did that this morning. But here's what I'm saying. There's so much purpose in why we come. And there's such a marriage between coming and going. Because it's an as-you-go gospel. But we come to encourage ourselves and stir ourselves in love and good works. We, we come to encourage one another daily. At least we give to the hardness of heart and deceitfulness of sin. We come to stay in tune and in touch with what we've become through Him so that when we leave, we look more like Him. So the only reason we come, it's not just to get our needs met and get blessed by God and do our spiritual hey God. We come together to be encouraged and sharpened so that when we leave, we look more like Him. We're the body of, the body is the expression of a thing. Right? In the garden when he made man, he made man in his image and God is love. So he really just put flesh on love so that he could flesh out love. Do you get it? You see, we don't understand that we have so many rights. We have rights. And when you're a Christian, you deny yourself. Pick up your cross. You know what that means, to pick up your cross? Did Jesus deserve to go to the cross? But did he? Did he deserve what he went through? But did he? Oh, carried his cross. Sometimes you're judged for things you didn't do. Sometimes you're misread, misunderstood, falsely accused. Sometimes things just aren't fair. So we have attorneys on every corner. We stand for our rights. There's a place for attorneys. I'm not saying they're bad. But the way we use them, all of a sudden, you slip on someone's sidewalk. And now it's their fault. Holding them accountable in every way. Come on. I forbid we embrace that mentality. We have so many rights. I'll tell you what right you have as a Christian, scripturally. You can prove it scripturally. You deny yourself, that means you lay down your rights to possess one. You have one right to manifest Him. Mercy woke you up today to give you another opportunity to manifest Him. That's why you're alive. Let us make man in our... We've made it all about us. The fall of man did that. Selfish, self-centered, self-preserving, self-concerned, attitudes, issues, hmm, whatever. That's man. That's the fall of man. Anybody can live that. Anybody can do that. It doesn't make you much to live that way. You know, I gave him a piece of my mind. How much can we really give? <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave him a piece of my mind. How'd, you, how'd your work day go? Uh, my boss, I'll tell you, I just finally opened up. I gave him a piece of my mind. And I mean, you feel like somebody all of a sudden. And it's so shallow. And it has to do with nobody but you. At the cost of everyone else. See, before Christ, I used to live my life at your expense. And it was every man for himself. Now in Christ, it's at the expense of your life and your life, people. You don't hold them accountable for their sins. You show mercy so that God can turn their heart. You put the ear back on Malchus, even though he's ready to kill you. 
because that's God. But I promise you, that's not the world. And sadly enough, it's not most Christians. No wonder people aren't very attracted to what we say is right. It's not in your doctrine. It's in your lifestyle. It's not in your preaching. It's in your living. Jesus has been so gracious to teach me so many things in 16 years. And, and he told me I was just a few days old. The Lord was talking to me in English in my spirit. I was pretty freaked out. I was a saved three days pastor. I was three days saved at work, and I was hearing Jesus in English in my spirit. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is God. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and he said, I'm going to put revelations of love and righteousness in you. You're going to speak to many of my people. I'm three days old in the Lord. And I'm hearing this stuff. And I've had the great honor to just walk in this out. Simple examples like this. And we're going to read Colossians. I didn't give up on that. I probably shared this before. Maybe some of you heard this on the tape. But I share this story a lot. There's a lot of stories. But this one, this one blessed me because it's relatable to us. Some folks got together, bought me a new truck. It's pretty. Cherry red truck. It's first. Thomas. I had it for three months. First new truck I ever had in my life. I would have never bought a new truck. I'm not that kind of guy. I buy one a year or two, three old, and drive it until it dies, and then I pray for it to live. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> these folks got together and said, oh, it's one of these scary intercessor ladies. You know, you know the ladies that just pray and they have those eyes. And she came up and said, I've been praying. I said, oh, you have. <laughs> and, she says, and I heard the Lord. I said, you did? What? What did he say? <laughs> she said, Pastor Dan needs a new truck. And I said, honey, I'm not even thinking new truck. I, I'm not a new truck guy. I'm not even thinking new truck. She said, well, you're getting one. Because God said you need one. Well, see, I didn't realize that I was going to be driving. I was just pastoring. And this thing opened up where all of a sudden I'm driving. It's 30,000 miles a year. That's what I just did this past year. And I'm not thinking that probably the truck I'm driving that's 13 years old probably isn't a 30,000 mile a year truck. <laughs> Unless Jesus really breathes on it. <laughs> she said, well, you're getting a new truck because I even heard people's names in prayer. Called them and they're so excited because they were hearing the same thing. And I'm a little overwhelmed by this and feeling a little weirded out because I'm. It's, it's a humble thing. It's... There's, you know, you think you're humble, but when people start wanting to buy you a truck, some people are like, praise God, yeah, give it up, you know? I was like, oh, no, you don't buy me a truck. Because I tend to think all the need out there, people homes, all this stuff, and I'm thinking, a new truck? I don't need a new truck. Well, they started pouring money into this account in the church, and next thing you know, I got a new truck. You know, just three months. Paid for. I was leaving a lot with it, it got overwhelmed halfway home. This is God will give you cool experiences. I got to this point in the road, and I'm not a spooky kind of mystical kind of guy, but God can mess with you sometimes. I got in the stretch of road, and God started speaking to me, and I said, this is you. This is your love for me. This is your love for me through people. This is amazing. And the presence of God came over me, and et cetera. It was just amazing. Two years later, I have a good buddy who's a son in the faith to me, Todd White. I gave him that truck because he started traveling everywhere. And out of my account, I was able to actually get another. When I got to that spot in the road, I didn't realize I was at that spot in the road. Isn't that weird? I got to the stretch of road. I'm not trying to be weird. Like this. this is just the first thing. I was driving, and I said, Lord, this is just so amazing two years ago. I drove off that lot and I was humbled and overwhelmed and look what you've done and now you've raised up. And now he has a truck he can drive in and know he's so well because he never had a new vehicle in his life. And, 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 and it's only two years old and, and, and he said it's the nicest thing he ever had. And, and, I, and that presence of God came over and I started weeping and I said, thank you for coming. And thank you. And I looked up and it's, there was a rain shower coming. And I looked up and there's this beautiful rainbow. And I'm like, oh God. And I look and right behind it, was another one. And I'm thinking, two trucks, me and Todd, God's all, and there's these two rainbows, and I'm crying, and the presence of God is in my little truck. And I'm like, oh. 
It's just cool stuff. So who knows that stuff touches your heart, right? But you don't covet that. It's, it's God's bigger than I. It's a gift. It's a blessing. It's not who you are. You don't let that stuff attach to your identity. Because three months down the road with my cherry pretty truck, I'm driving to a meeting to a pickup spot for some buddies and we're going to go to a meeting. I'm driving and this dear woman who just turned 65, I found that out later because I had the police report and stuff, it was just right after her birthday. She's looking this way, I'm coming this way. There's a big long line of traffic as far as she can see coming into the medical center and the car in front was turning. There's a whole line. She thought, oh, they're turning, I can shoot across. Well, she forgot there's another lane. Yeah. Accident. Whoever, whoever, whoever did something like that? Accident. Whoever went through a red light and realized, oh my gosh, that was red. Whoever went through a stop sign and went, oh my goodness, there was a stop sign there. See, we don't realize we all do that stuff. But when somebody does it at our expense, we hold them so accountable. Don't we? And you know what? The measure you judge is the measure you judge. Where there's no mercy given, there's no mercy received. Some of us wonder why things are so tough. It's because we're so tough towards things. Now, this is strong, strength preaching. I'm not mad at you. I'm trying to help. I want to be your friend. This dear lady, she wants the gas pedal. Oh, they're turning. I'm right there. All of a sudden, here's this lady. From me to where you're sitting, huh? she just shoots out in front of me, and I'm going 35. There's no time to even touch your brakes. When you're going 35 from here to there, you're there now. I go, oh, Jesus. I got up on my wheel. I literally said, I remember going, oh, Jesus. And I went because I saw a passenger. I was going to Tebow. And I, and I didn't know then that there was a, a young girl in the back, but I saw the passenger. And I whipped like this and tried to get in front of them. And she's bolting across, trying to bolt across. And it's like we're racing to the same point. <laughs> All I remember is it was like a ride at an amusement park for about a second and a half. Boom, boom. Everything got bright white. I thought I was in heaven for a millisecond with my airbag. It was just like, <laughs> I was looking for Jesus. This is airbag. So. <laughs> Boom! The car, such a consciousness, it's grace, it's impossible to live this way. Without communion with God, yielding to Him, singing songs like that. Watch, getting alone when nobody's looking in the world. And I understand I'm not against computers, TVs, I'm not against this, I'm not preaching it. But taking the time away from all the stuff that occupies our whole life and seeking Him in the secret place. So he sees you there and rewards you in the open. Prayers like you sang, I mean, that was amazing. It was so timely. Father, I just thank you for your love. I just thank you for having me transform my heart. Secret place, door closed, nobody around. Driving, nobody looking. Father, I love you. I yield myself to you. I so want your heart. Consume me. Holy Spirit, make me one with who you are. You get it? When you pray like that, that's faith. When you release faith, guess what comes from heaven? Grace. Guess who changes you? He does, not you. You desire the change with the sincere and pure heart. You can't bite your lip hard enough and make yourself like God. But you can yield to who He is, and who He is begins to manifest to you and through Him. Because it's impossible to be in something like that and not have a little disposition change, not be like, oh my goodness, not be a little shook up. I don't even understand that stuff. I've been in several of them, actually. I was in one with my children. The paramedics got mad at me, thought I was playing games when I was saying I was the driver of the truck because the truck was crushed like a can. We had to bust out of my side. And we were so okay, and I looked just like I look now. This is you as I look. They're looking at my truck, looking at me, and the paramedics are mad at me said, this is no time for jokes, sir. We need to find the driver of the truck. I said, sir, I am the driver. Sir, I need to know who's driving the truck. And I said, I'm not sure why there's a controversy here, sir. I'm not trying to be frustrating to you. I'm the driver. 
and all of a sudden it hit me. I said, oh my gosh, I understand why there's a problem. I said, you don't believe I'm the driver because of my disposition. He said, sir, if you were the driver of that truck, I've never seen anything like this. I've been to thousands of accidents. I said, well, it exploded. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> it's impossible to live that way. But you can yield to him and grace can live through your life. What are you saved by? Your works or grace? So what do you live your life by? He says, come on, you were saved by the Spirit. Why would you try to live it in the flesh? If you're flesh-minded, it's death. If you're spirit-minded, it's life and peace. It's possible to have peace in this world because you have peace with God. If you have peace with God, you'll make peace with men. Oh, can I say a real strong, challenging statement? If you really have relationship with God, really, you begin to love people because God's love. Don't let your knowledge of God take the place of knowing God. The biggest trap in the church. The knowledge of God replaces knowing God. I pushed down the airbag. I never had an airbag, a truck with an airbag before, I promise. <laughs> it was always an older truck. Now I got an airbag. So I had to contend with the airbag. It was like a big marshmallow in my face, man. It was amazing. I didn't know where I was, I just knew I stopped. It was just, boom, you ever in an accident? Boom, you just like lights go out for a minute. You don't even know what happened. Just, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, I'm so conscious that I was in an accident and people were involved. I fought out of the airbag and it was out. And in two seconds, probably, I was out of the car. And, I'm, and they're, they're doing what you do in an accident. Oh my God. The girl in the back is bald. I said, sir, are you well? Are you in any pain at all? Are you okay? And he said, oh, I'm just a little shook up. Okay, look at me, sir. I'm a Christian man. I love you with all my heart. Jesus is awesome. He can help with these things. Give me your hand. In Jesus' name, I would pray for him. Pray peace over him. Bless him. Girl's crying in the back. Got in there and prayed for her. She, her cries turned into a little whimper. I run around to the other side. Ma'am, are there any injuries? Is there any pain? Are you okay? Your neck, your back, how are you? She's just, she's just so upset. Her window shattered. Her car is crunched. I never looked at my truck. Isn't that cool? It wasn't like, oh my God, no, my new truck. <laughs> oh, me. Uh, what's the matter with you? Did you see the sign? If she saw the sign, she wouldn't have went through it. Come on! But these things are normal to us, and they're not normal to heaven. We need change. Huh. So I get down, are you okay, honey? Give me your hands, I want to pray for you. She's crying. I found out later this was her second total loss accident in one week. That was her daughter's car. She smashed hers a week before. She just turned 65. Put yourself in her shoes now. Am I losing my edge? I'm going to hurt someone. Should I even be driving? Two in a week, what's coming of me? Imagine the pressure she's under in her soul right now. Responsibility. All that liability. Insurance. Not getting any younger. Look at the pressure on that young woman right now. The last thing she needs is Mr. Christian. Frustrated at the cost of her soul that's already in trouble. The last thing she needs me to do is kick the dirt and make a face and say, hey, are you okay? Come on, I'm real with you today. The last thing she needs is me loving my own life more than her. You love your own life not unto death. You love not your own life unto I leaned in there and I said, honey, I want to pray for you. And she, out of her mouth, burst. Oh, no! It's a brand new truck! She saw the temporary registration in it. It's shiny, pretty, and besides that weren't hit. 
because I put it in front of her, and she hit me in the front wheel well and went the whole way down my side. Toyotas are tough, baby. A good little commercial for Toyota. That thing didn't come in on me at all and stopped it. But it just, it just, it just, you know, they got those reinforced sides, and it, it didn't smash it at all, but the outside was bad. Her nose of her car stuck between my bed and the cab and just pushed about that far. <laughs> and it was mess. Up. I mean, when you looked at it, it was total, you know what I mean? But she could tell it was a new truck. She says, oh no, as if it wasn't bad enough. I hit a new, it's a new truck. And she cries this out with despair. And I kind of thought, oh, bless her heart. I said, I said honey, it's OK. It's just a truck. It can be replaced. I said, but you, how are you? You don't understand. It's a new truck. I said, honey, it's just a truck. Watch what she said. She got mad at me. She said, you don't understand. The driver's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> Wonder if you are in the Christ and not in your flesh. Wonder if you don't love your own life. Wonder if you see the value of her soul way above yours. If that's true, you can tip her chin and say, honey, look at me. I am the driver. Watch what came out of her. Oh, God bless you. And I held her like she was my grandma. My mother. She just sobbed on my shoulder. I love you, honey. I'm not one bit upset that you want to talk to her. Accidents happen, sweetheart. You just made a mistake. I release you. Jesus, God bless and comfort this woman. The girl in the back is starting to cry again because of her outbreaking, right? She's bald. This is a young teenage girl. She's bald. I said, can I get in the back of the car? She said, I crawled in the car. I said, come here, girl. Come here, honey. I love you. She crawled over and laid on me. And I just... I just rode. I just destroyed the mic. <laughs> and what I did was I cradled her and comforted her and loved her with all my heart. And guess what she did? She completely stopped crying and just laid against me like I was her daddy. And I talked to her how everything's going to be okay and all these things can work out. You follow me? That's good. You can do more than one thing at a time. <laughs> I'm not boasting on me. I'm boasting on His grace in our lives and the potential and possibility of Christian living. You follow me? Now, if you're not hearing me clear, you think, you know, yay for you. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying yay for the power of God available to our lives if we're willing to yield ourselves to Him. Because I'll tell you what, anybody can be a mere man on that scene. And that doesn't mean anything special, does it? That leaves no legacy, does it? That's just normal living. So let's let the gospel be supernatural and change our lives forever. Amen? Hold the love one another. You okay that I'm on this track? It's why we gather. So our hearts can be conditioned to leave and look more like him. Don't even be here because it's Sunday. Be here because it's an honor to be together in his presence born again. <laughs> Let's read this and I'll wrap up. I'll, I'll try to be really gracious with you all. Colossians chapter 3. See, that whole born again thing is a big deal. We turned it into praying and prayer to go to heaven. We forgot a lot of, in a lot of circles, we even forgot about water baptism. Water baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. It's the sign of an old life dead and a new life risen. Water baptism is a big deal. If you've never been water baptized, get an understanding. That's best you can. Get water baptized as soon as possible. 
Because what you're doing is saying, I'm dying to me and the old and everything that ever was. Everything ever done against me, said against me. Do you understand that now the gospel has come and people are still living in yesterday? Do you understand there's Christians that still say they can't be free because of what somebody did to them when they were five? Now that Christ has come? See, my dad was an alcoholic my whole life. He never told me he loved me and told me I'd be nothing and used to curse me. And when I was old enough to drive, I had to go pick him up at the bar because he couldn't drive and got him home. What does that have to do with who I am now that Christ has come? Actually, it changes the perspective of who my dad was. It makes my heart have compassion for him. It makes me have mercy towards that situation. It makes me feel sympathy for him because he was the one with severe trouble. Why would I let what he was reflect on me and let it multiply in me? Now that Christ has come and showed me I have greater value. I'm worth the blood of Jesus. I'm worth the spirit of God living in me. I'm actually a house he desires, desires to dwell in. So what's the fact that my dad was an alcoholic my whole life and never said I love you have anything to do with now that Christ has come? Why would I even connect it to? It doesn't even make sense to me, but it sure makes rational sense to the church. Because the church still can't be free because of what my dad did or didn't do. Because of what Uncle Charlie did to me. Because of... But what, what did Jesus do? And when do you separate yourself from man and enter into God? When do you realize that he rescued you and snatched you out of the darkness and the snare of sin was trying to swallow you up and blind your heart so much that when the gospel came, you couldn't receive it? Life was trying to harden you so bad that when love knocked on your door, nobody was home. Are you hearing me? Stop giving excuse for the flesh. Justification to remain the same. Here's another one. Man, I better look this way so nobody thinks I'm talking to him. Don't let your story be worse than anybody else's. Wonder if I have a story. But wonder if it's irrelevant now that I have his story. It's not about comparing tragedies and trauma and finding excuse for the flesh. It's finding a reason to live by the Spirit. It's not even about feeling sorry for yourself ever again. It's rejoicing that he came and rescued you. And now he's made you more than a conqueror through him. Do you know he fought the battle? He paid the price. He handed us the dividends. He died. We get the newness of life. He was beaten and suffered, and we get touched by grace and mercy and love. People say, what's more than a conqueror? Who knows Reverend Schombach? Reverend Schombach is from the old school. He's a good guy. He's still around. I heard him on the tape years ago define what more than a conqueror means. He said, you got this heavyweight fighter in the ring. 15 round bout. He's slugging away. Blood. Uh, he's fighting he's down into the end rounds. Finally, the 15 round come. At the end of the fight, they lift up his hand. He's the conqueror. Everybody's cheering, applauding, they come and give him a multi million dollar check for his victory. He's in the locker room, he's cleaning up, he's swelled, his eyes are swelled. He, he took a beating, but he's the conqueror. He took a beating. He gets home, he goes in the house, he hands his wife the check. She just became more than conqueror. <laughs> Not what Jesus did. He went through the fight. He got beaten up. He accomplished everything. And then he handed us that kingdom. That's amazing. We must be pretty special to God. We must have amazing potential. We must be more than we think. In reality, of His grace, we must have an incredible future. The possibilities of this grace must be way greater than some of us have comprehended. There must be an amazing value to our lives for God would have never pay the price of His Son. Nobody pays a lot for nothing. In all our lives, we thought He just died because we're sinful messes. No, He died to get the sinful mess off of us because we're created to be sons. The reason he died is to repossess or to purchase our value by removing the lie, which is sin. Now that's the love of the Father. 
my whole life, the gospel made me more sin conscious. And I thought, man, this poor guy had to give people a call because I'm such a loser. But one day, because he died, God will accept me as if I'm not a loser. But in the meantime, I'm a loser. <coughs> now I realize I'm not. I realize we won. I realize the old nature's gone, the new nature's come. Now I can be in an accident and manifest Jesus and not even try. It'd be a big difference if it'd be like this. Boom, tsh, boom, and I'm behind the airbag. Okay, Dan, get a hold of yourself. Look, they call you Pastor Dan. <laughs> you have to rightly represent the gospel. Come on, get yourself together, buddy. It's Christ in you. Well, hi, everyone. That would be weird. <laughs> it's who you become. It's not who you're trying to be. You're not trying to apply sermons as you get thrown into Christ. The Word becomes flesh and lives through your life in the face of every child. I was in my bedroom years ago, 12 years ago. The Lord said, Dan, I don't want you to live in Crossroads Christianity. I'm in my bed. He's talking to me in English. I'm like, what is Crossroads Christianity? I've never heard this sermon. He said, to where you see forks in the ground and have to determine what to say, do you stop, look, listen, get a hold of yourself. He said, most of my people live Crossroads Christianity where they see optional view. He said, I just want you to see through the narrow way of truth. Your eye be single and you become the word. Don't know the word, become the word. And there's no fork in the ground. There's one way that I And I was like, astounded by him telling me he's following me. And I was like, I want that. So what did I start praying? I started praying that way, yielding myself, asking for grace. And guess what God does? Where your eyes not multiple choice, why do you land? But it's one way, single eye living. If my eye is single, my whole body's flooded with light. So if there's not a flooding of light in your life, it's probably your view. Because if it's single, there's light. If it's not single, there's darkness. And if the light in you is darkness, do you hear the perversion? You're created for light. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What's he saying? Just how twisted is your view. Wow. See, there's so many things we can preach. It's all good. It's a little too busy. Just grab it. <coughs> Give me, I'll be done in five, ten minutes. I'm hoping. I will. If then you were raised with Christ, since then it means. Seek the things which are where? I'm in Colossians chapter 3. Seek the things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Watch this. See, so you have the purpose to do this. Set your mind on these things, not on the things of the earth. You know the temptation is to look at what people are doing, saying how things are going. Oh, oh my, oh, oh. And why? Then all the motivation of prayer is based on what's wrong and what we're afraid of and what we're fearing. And we're actually being driven by life toward God instead of living from God toward life. Big difference. The prayer of faith and the prayer of fear are totally opposite, but most of the time we pray the prayer of fear. We pray because of what we're fearing most. And our prayer is rooted in fear and has nothing to do with faith working through love and covenant and the promise of the Father. We go, oh my God. We get a diagnosis, we have terminal cancer, we take on the identity of a dying man and then we cry out to God and turn this into principles we're applying, hoping we have results. It's very impersonal and very distant from love. That's why we lose so many times. Just straight. Just talking straight. Don't ever let what you're going through become who you are. You let what he went through become who you are. And you'll fight the good fight. What I'm going through has no reflection on me. I don't turn into spectrum. What did I do wrong? What door did I open? Where are you, God? Why aren't you? That's what a lot of people do. You can't do that and fight at the same time. In fact, when you do that, you reveal your identity in crisis, and there's no confidence even in your heart because you're in question. I'm not in question. Sometimes the devil's just a jerk, and sometimes there's adversity, and sometimes there's just trials, and sometimes stuff just happens. But I promise you, he loves us infallibly. And he's amazing, and we win. <laughs> Wonder if you can't change that. Then you'll see things change. You follow me? 
We contend for it. Set your mind on the things above. If for you die, why do we do this? Because, watch, this is what we have to understand as Christians. You die. See, some of us still love our own life. We still want rights. We still want the right to judge a person. We still want the right to be offended. We still want the right to determine how we're going to respond. The wonder if you surrender your right to Him and become one with Him. And He should respond. See, that's Christian living. You died. That's supposed to be common. You died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life. Now who's our life? Christ. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. See, there's some people that might hear what I'm saying and say, what, Edward? You, you know. But see, when Jesus appears, I'll appear with Him and they'll go, whoa. And realize that they're not one with His heart. And it says, men will give glory to Him for your sake. Because they realize then the truth about him. <coughs> don't let what people say and think make you insecure. It's because people don't receive what you have to say, or even your love, or even your mercy. Don't you let it move you, because then even your love and mercy expression is still about you. Don't, how can you be rejected when you're doing things for love? It's impossible for you to reject me. I love you. What I do, I don't do for me. I do for you. If I'm out on the street and I do something for someone and they get in my face and tell me to get away, you Christian fanatic, stop soliciting to me, you blankety blank. How does that reject me when I know my motives for them is love? And I didn't approach them for me. I approached them for them. Why wouldn't it re cause a mercy to come in me, a compassion in me, and why wouldn't my heart feel godly sorrowful for that person? Why would I get offended at what they say when they realize they don't know who they are? Come on. We prove this stuff in the church we don't understand. See, we've got Sister Sally. She sits here, right? I'll make her up. Sister Sally is the sweetest lady in the church, okay? She's just the, she's like, she's just amazing. And she's the precious, and, and it seems like Sister Sally's the one that has the wretch husband. And Sister Sally is so sweet, and yet her husband is such a jerk. That's what we think. And he won't come to church, and he's mean at her. And, and most of the men are thinking, that guy doesn't even know what he's blessed with, and they're mad at him, and the women are like, oh, she's so sweet, how can you mistreat her? And all of a sudden, we start cuddling Sister Sally and doting over her and trying to protect her. And oh, you poor thing, oh, honey. And we actually give her permission to be a hurt, abused, broken woman. Instead of teaching her the heart of God, the love of God, and the compassion towards her husband, and that her husband doesn't know who he is, and he's the one with the problem, he's lost. And then when we pray for the husband, it's only because we're mad at him because he's such a jerk and doesn't know what he has, and da-da-da, and all our prayers is, God, knock him off this horse, wake him up, da da And we're not even praying for him because we love him or show mercy towards him or see his value. We're praying because he's so bad towards someone so sweet. And we're very biased. We take sides, and all our prayers stop at the ceiling because none of them are rooted in love. It's just rightness and feeling sorry for people and giving people permission to be broken and battered and hurt. And then we're setting up boundaries, protecting our trust, not letting people too close. There's no wall around me. There's no boundary. I'm not protecting myself from you. I guess you can't hurt me. Do you get this? It's gospel. Therefore, since this is true, put to death your members on the earth. Fornication, that's any kind of sexual immorality, anything outside of the covenant before God and man. Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. And why is that whole sexual thing a big deal? Because it all reveals self-centered desire. What's the big root behind pornography? It's just man fulfilling his own fantasy. It's women in insecurity trying to meet the need that only God can fill. It's just a, it's just a self-serving, needs-meeting thing that's a facade that never, ever, ever fulfills. It's a bad place. It leaves you high and dry. It's not that God's sitting there going, ah, eh, you accept that. No, God's sitting there broken because you're so lost and empty without him. You're hurting yourself. We're so busy thinking how bad we're hurting the heart of God. God's hurting for us. Or he'd have never sent his son. 
He doesn't have his arms crossed and his brow raised. His heart is yearning for his people. He's not hurt. He's hurting for us. You follow me? Some of us have a wrong impression of God. He loves to love us and restore us and forgive us. If it wasn't true, he never came to me at work that night. When I went to work, sure, I hated my wife, ready to move in with a girl six, seven, eight years younger, eight years younger than me, start my life over, just get a new model, get a fresh face in my life, or I didn't waste my time with her anyway, the mother of my children. Why? Because my heart's hard, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. So I go to work, saying I'm a Christian, and I'm a million miles from the heart of God. And I don't want nothing to do with nothing. Nobody talked to me, preached to me, I'm mad, I'm angry, and yet God came to save my soul that night. Why? Because he loves me. And he knows that I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm deceived, and I'm lost, and he had mercy on me. I let his little knucklehead and set me free. He did it. Changed me forever. In a half hour after that experience, I knew that I loved my wife and never knew love before. It was the first time I understood that love. Why? Because love came inside of me. <sighs> Half hour before, I was sure I hated the woman called my wife. Half hour after my encounter with God, I thought of her and I went, oh, and I loved her. <laughs> Why? Because love came inside of me. Nor I can try to love her. I'm supposed to love her. Praise God. I'm supposed to love her. I need to love her. We even incorporate this into, well, I love them, but I don't have to like them. That is trash. Let's throw that out of the church. That's an excuse for opinionated bias, hard heart, human stuff. I love them, but I don't like them. That's ridiculous. You like who they're created to be. You make a draw on that. It's possible to say, I love them, but I don't like them. I don't have to like them. What a compound. Where did we get that stuff? Must have been the devil. <laughs> okay, let me move on. <laughs> Look at verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off the old man with his deeds and you put on the new man. How do I put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy without getting into works? Good question. How do I do that without biting my lip and trying? I separated from my identity. Father, I thank you that my heart and your heart are one. I thank you that never again, Lord God, am I just succumb to anger and frustration and wrath because you placed love in me. God, you're changing my eyes and my view towards men and my view about life. I thank you I'm no longer alive under myself, but I'm alive under you. And then you sing little songs like she sang today. And you thank Holy Spirit for transforming you from within. See, we don't pray that way because our whole life's consumed with praying things that concern us in our day and what God needs to do to make our day more convenient. We think prayer is this, God, another day of work. Please, Lord, have mercy on me. Please let the car run good. I don't want to get on in red lights again. And please, the boss is acting like such a jerk. I wish you'd change his heart. And then by the end of the day, you're wondering if God loves you. Because none of those things happen the way you want. And why isn't he hearing my prayers? And you call that prayer life. <laughs> it's a self-concerned, complaining thing. <laughs> it has nothing to do with change that is in it. Because you need to love your boss and bring the best out of him. And it's so, okay, you can stop at the red light, just intercede for a friend and pray or just rejoice and have a good time. Don't get nervous. See, I get a layover or I miss a flight or the connection. And in the world, you're like, no, man. Oh, God, where are you? This ain't you, God. I want to get home. And you see people at the airport, they have way lost their joy. <laughs> they, they, they are like, Brr. But see, if you're not alive for yourself. What's a lay? What's the big deal of a layover? It's just more time to meet somebody you might never meet again. It's just some time to love somebody, find somebody sick, pray for them, and watch God heal somebody. I was just in the Denver airport, and a Vietnam vet was coming through like this. Vietnam vet. How long ago was the Vietnam War? This guy's walking like this for a long time. I said, hey, buddy, what did you do to your knee? Ah, uh, bullet straight through my knee. I said, no way. He said, Vietnam vet, man. He said, took out everything. He said, it's been like that since. I said, man, let me bless you. Come here, buddy. I want to pray for you. Oh, no, no, thank you. Ain't nothing you can do for my knee. He said, it's just the way it is. But thanks for caring. And he walked away. I'm sitting there like, he didn't understand. I said, yes, God, you're amazing. You breathed in the dirt. and man jumped up. You can fix his knee. I'm, I'm like, but I don't want to offend him. I want to bless him. And the Lord said, just go talk to him. I said, okay. 
So I went and I sat down and wrote the screen and I said, hey buddy, I, I, I'm not trying to offend you or frustrate you or pursue you in an overbearing way. Man, I love people. Jesus is teaching you to love people and care about you. I really want to pray for you. Sir, there's nothing you can do for my needs. It's a bullet for my name. He said, if you really want to bless me, pray for my finances because I really need help. There's monies that are supposed to come to me and I'm being withheld and they're supposed to come and I need them yesterday. So if you really want to bless me and pray for me, pray for me. I said, man, I would love to. Give me your hands. And he could tell I was sincere when I prayed. He could tell I didn't pray a came in prayer. And he could tell that I had compassion for him. So he said, man, thanks. And I said, look, God loves you, man. Them finances are going to roll, buddy. I'm telling you. He looks at me and he's listening and if you tell him serious, I said, now look, I didn't just pray for your finances to have access to your need. I know you don't understand what I'm saying about your need. It's been your reality for how long now. But please give me God and pray for your need because Jesus is amazing. He said, well, man, if you want to, go ahead. He had no clue what was coming. He had no clue where my heart was, where my seal was, my compassion. I did a little different than I do a lot of times because it's not a textbook. People are different. It's not a man now. It's a leading in the spirit. I prayed for his knee in the airport, and I didn't ask him to check it. I didn't say test it because I didn't want to tax him. He's already giving me permission to pray, which I was like, yeah. So I prayed, and I backed off. I said, God bless you, man. I said, we're right at the gate, ready to go on the plane. So we sit down, and they announce that we're boarding. So he's still sitting there. He's in like the, lab, the zone three or something. I'm in zone two or one. I'm up ahead of him. I get up, and I'm getting on the plane. And all of a sudden, he gets up, gets up off of his chair. Vietnam War comes through the airport like this. All those years, he gets up off of his chair, and he steps like I step, and he freaks out. <laughs> Vietnam War. Oh, nothing you can do for my knee, buddy. Did he have any faith? He doesn't even have a clue. Guess who's supposed to have a clue? The one that represents the kingdom. He has nothing to do with that man. Jesus loves that man. And wants to make it home. The guy freaks out. He makes a ruckus on the plane. I love that stuff. Because he's preaching for me. I don't even have to do it. I'm just like, you're manifesting. And then he freaks out. And people know it's real. He's walking on the plane. I found my chair. It's, it's, you're sitting in your chair. And here he comes. And he's walking. And you're in tears and he's in tears. And I say, what's up with your knee, man? He said, it's good. It's really good. Praise God. Praise God. He's on the plane. Praise God. I said, I told you, man, Jesus rocks. He's amazing. He's not a philosophy. He's not a Christmas or Easter story. He's the Lord of all. Now watch. This is the everyday life of a Christian. Watch. We're sitting there and the plane's not taking off. The plane's not taking off. The plane's not taking off. And we're like, man, the plane's not taking off. And I look and there's paramedics in the front of the plane. Well, I see that someone. Right? We're talking, whispering around, what's going on with her? Oh, that lady, didn't you know? Man, she stood up, she's tall, she stood up, and the, the hatch was open, and she stood right up into the hatch. The luggage. And she cracked her head, they think she has a good coat. And I'm like, what? Oh. Well, you've got all the airport people around her, you've got liabilities, you've got paramedics. There's a, you know, you got it. you don't just, excuse me, press through, break through, break through her. You know, you don't just bust in. You just watch, you look, you look. All of a sudden, they're walking her back. And she's, she's trembling. She's hurting. She has an ice pack on her head. She's in trouble. You can see anguish in her face. She's overwhelmed. She's feeling self-conscious, all that stuff. She sits in a chair, and I see the airline people around her. And they're talking to her, and I can hear them. They're about from here to you guys. And they're saying, now listen. You know we want you to go for medical treatment. You know we wanted you to go. Now since you declined, we have to honor that, but we need you to tell us and inform us if there's any change, if there's any problem, even if we're in flight, you must let us know immediately, et cetera, et cetera, so we can make decisions by the God. I think, wow, this must be serious. This lady's hurt. 
So I'm sitting there in my chair, and I'm just like a cat, you know, just waiting. And as soon, because I know they're going to take off because they need to get going, right? So as soon as those people are off the plane, they're going to start backing out and do the whole safety thing, right? So as soon as they turn and take two steps away from her, I'm out of my seat. I'm just down like this. I say, oh. I say man, you must have really crack your head. She looked at me. Tears still running down her face. I said, this this isn't a kind gesture. I'm extremely sincere, and I'm very serious about it. Please give me your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I believe that Jesus Christ makes it like it never hit your head. And that you enjoy this life, and that you see his glory and his love. Just, that's all I want her to do. That's all she needs to do. Father, I thank you for the amazing love. God, let your grace and power touch her. Every trace of injury and power of her. God bless her that she never hear her head in this flat. Thank you, God. She never be dead. I don't know she God bless you. She's like, I slipped away, right? We take off. Who flies? You have to get to a certain place where they take off the seatbelt thing and you release to go to the restroom or whatever. As soon as that seatbelt thing came off, boom, she's out of her chair. She turns and finds me. She comes walking back like this. She has no evidence of hitting her head because of the gospel that lives in that heart. But if you're self-conscious, if you're in identity crisis, if you're mad at the world, if you don't understand why he lives in you, you won't even think like I'm talking. You'll let your Bible knowledge take the place of manifesting. I can tell you so many stories like that. It's just fun. I had two buddies flying with me in other seats. We got to the luggage to get our luggage. Guess who comes walking over and gives me the biggest sincere hug? And says, thank you so much with tears in her eyes. I said, honey, you thank Jesus. He gave me the great honor of being a man of God. It was my great privilege to pray for you in the kingdom to touch you. Jesus loves you and he is God. Who knows that'll mark her forever? Go on. Ah. I am not feeling that I gotta stop. You see verse 9, don't lie to one another. You put off the deeds of the old man and you put on the new man. Do you see that? Look who the new man is. He's renewed in knowledge according to an agreement with the image of the one who created him. You see who the new man is? In agreement with the image of God. So are we Christians to go to heaven or to take back the nature of God by grace and manifest Him? You see why we're Christians? Don't let anything influence your day but that truth. Don't let people be your barometer. Don't let life and circumstances determine you. The gospel's bigger than that. You can be too. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one that created us. So we're brought back to original value through the Christ. Let us make man in our... And the Spirit of God lives in us as if we've never sinned or failed. Honey, can you come up and play just whatever you want to